And now it's time for uh, to invite our next wonderful uh, boss lady on the stage. Um, here we've got uh, Pia. Pia represents OP Crew. Oh, oh my God! I'll give you a loop, uh, play uh, more, a little bit, few more minutes, so you get things. Uh, range up. Uh, Pia works at OP Group as a senior specialist in customer value creation. Uh, she's also my kind of long-term uh, accomplish and a colleague uh, from past uh, years at Alta University. But Pia has been uh, firmly positioned at OP Group for about five years now. Four, 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 four or five-ish uh, feels like eternity. Um, but now she's here, so we'll be able to enjoy the kind of uh, great insights that she's prepared to present us about the uh, stuff that uh, exciting stuff that goes around at OP Group. So please welcome Pia Hanukainen. Thanks, Lassie. It's it's nice to be here. By the way, is it very hot in here? I, my glasses were just a minute, minute ago getting really foggy, and I'm not sure if it's the air or all the data that we're talking. But anyway, I come from OP Financial Group and I'm not gonna represent, like, present the, the company. Most of you know it's a large financial industry. And when we start from there, we actually have four forces that impact the design of services and business models in the financial industry. So technology enables regulation adjust boundaries. Competition sets the pace, but the customer decides. So as a designer, whatever you design, it has to be feasible compliant, viable, and valuable. Design means many things, but on today's topic, I'd like to say it's about making insightful decisions. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is how we at OP are organizing customer insight for design, help designers make these insightful decisions. Well, there's a delivery gap and opportunity these research results are from 2005, but trust me, take any research, any survey, you get the same results from any year. So companies think they are way better than how their customers see them. There's never been so much data about customers available. The thing is what we do with the data. And typically, the larger the company, the more data there is, applies to us very easily too many systems and so much data, and I don't know what to do with it. But while the design practice grows in an organization like, like OP, also the need for accurate customer insight becomes highlighted. So customer data must become customer insight, and it has to be delivered, dished out somehow, that is a meaningful way for designers. Everybody loves two by two, so I have one. Uh, on the left, there's past. On the right, there's future. And you can measure things or you can explore and find. Here you have known variables. So basically, quantitative methods measure the scale of these known variables. You get to know how much, but you won't know why. Here, on the other end, you have unknown variables. And to tackle those, you need qualitative research. Uh, this way you might actually learn why things are the way they are. And in this two by two, you can do all kinds of stuff. Let's not argue about the position of these boxes, but somewhere there. And the point is that all of this is what we're doing at OP and probably in all other companies also. But you need to know if it's about known variables or something you don't know yet. So how it used to be organized in OP, and I'm guessing it, this is the way it often is in companies. So uh, we had market research in strategy department, then we had our own data being crawled in, in uh, reporting and analytics, then we had customer experience metrics, uh, those were tackled in business units, and then customers were evolved by designers. Uh, this was in 2015 when I was hired as a research manager in strategy department. My job was to take care of the market research, but as I was the first designer ever in, in strategy, I also started wondering how is this research portfolio I'm taking care of, how is this feeding design or the early stages of service development? Well, it wasn't, so that was the case. The, the market research was just about to 
uh, tell us about what, how we're doing against competition. And at that time, designers were pretty self-sufficient. Uh, they relied mainly on customer interviews and user testing, and that's about it. But market research was not helping them. So all of this was carried out separately in separate, separate organizations. Eventually, while, while the internal design agency at OP was growing, we uh, were able to ramp up this customer insight team. The purpose of the team was to support designers. So we brought all of these three ingredients of customer insight together. And of course, while the daily life of designers uh, still included and still does customer involvement, the management of this uh, involvement process was also attached to the customer insight team. So we get a broader picture of what we're doing with customers and, and what kind of data is collected and how. The team members in this customer insight team have very various backgrounds. Uh, the previous speakers were talking about diversity and I think it is the key because magic happens when diverse backgrounds uh, meet together. But here we have ingredients. We need to go from ingredients to insight. And I'd like to say the meal is somewhere there between the ingredients. And, and the combination is quite unique. Uh, since the ingredients will not feed anybody, none of us want to eat ingredients, we want to eat a meal. So that's, that's why we uh, created this customer insight uh, unit or team. And what we achieved by bringing these ingredients together, we, we achieved efficiency. So insight was not gathered uh, per project every time from scratch. But we also achieved quality, meaning that whatever we did with data and insight, we learned and the learnings were accumulated. So the next project was always starting from somewhere like a better place than the previous one. And as I said, this, I, I find this unique. Uh, for example, in many other companies, customer experience metrics, they reside at marketing. Uh, and as me these CX metrics are, of course, key KPIs for, for business units and channels, but we use the same data from these metrics to, to cook these meals as, as one of the great ingredients. So we never look at them separately. Uh, I will walk through an example of a meal that, that is cooked out of uh, different types of ingredients. Uh, it's called motive-based customer segmentation. So what we have done is we first started with qualitative identification of potential variables. So what would be motives that would describe our customers? We did this together with designers. So we, we were trying to figure out what kind of axis we, we could use uh, on where we could put the customers. So we got, I don't know, 15 to 20 guesses. Then we uh, carried out a quantitative survey with 70 propositions, uh, approximately. So we quantified our guesses uh, about the motive axis. There were 15,000 OP customer respondents, so we got lots of quantitative data. After that, real data science happened. So we ran factor analysis and clustering of the data. And, and after that, we have some guesses that these would be the axis and these would be the segments on those axes. And then we, of course, needed to go back to qualitative validation because it doesn't help anybody if it doesn't make sense. So we brought the designers back and, and showed them how would you see, like, how, how would you be able to use these kind of segments? Do they make sense and so forth? So this was an iterative process between quantitative and qualitative. And then when we were sure that this is the way to go, we projected the segments from sample to the whole customer population, meaning all three point something million OP retail customers. And after that, we went back to the customer data and enriched the segments with the data. And of course, again, to qualitative description of all segments. It's not ending here. So we continuously enrich the segments by all research we do. 
So this is, I think, a perfect example of combining different backgrounds and different skills and data sets and, and continuously building on something you've done before. This is now an example of a business area uh, called Living and Housing Services. So now you have the axis uh, unaware, expert, stability, change, and you have five segments. Stable brownstones, dreamers, informed observers, reformers, in the middle, average Johannes, that's Finnish for Joe. And then we have, uh, for example, for the reformers, we have a qualitative description and some data to support it about life stages and so forth. And we also give this to designers as a dashboard. It's blurry for a reason, so that you can't read it. But anyway, you, you get to make selections like this and this business unit, this and this segment, uh, some other variables about our customer customer base, and then you get some uh, data from our databases according to that segment. So I think this is like a very good example of how to use data to support, uh, to support design. So what kind of data is needed? On the left, when you're designing for tomorrow, you need to research the customer. And on the right, when you're trying to sell today, you need to analyze the, the customer behavior. So, well, I, at this point I'd like to say there's always somebody, I'm probably, I'm sure somebody also in this audience, but you don't need to identify yourself. Uh, somebody always will say that, well, we have so much data in our systems, and boy, you know, we have lots of data in our systems. Let's crunch that data and there will be all the answers. Meaning that we go to our systems, dig out the data, and then be sure that there will be answers. Uh, but the data in our systems is like a narrowed view of the customer. The data is collected in the solution space we have been genius enough to offer to the customer, but that data will never say what else the customer is doing and why they are or are not doing it. So if we just look at our own data in our own systems, it's a very narrow view of the world. And I'm sorry to say this, but even our company is not like the whole picture of the customer's life. So, so then we need to do something else. And that's the yellow part. So we need to research and dig out the needs and motives and so forth. But throughout this journey, we need to take of the, uh, be, be informed by the customer's life stages. And of course, because, because it's a business, we need to know how much value the customer is creating for OP in this case. Uh, if you go back to how customer insight and design work, so if there's strategic, tactical, and operational design, uh, on strategic level, we, we are giving out the meals, so basically key insights relevant to the, the, the business area and this motivates segmentation and trends and so forth. On tactical level, uh, there's usually some special diets that need to be served. So the meal uh, on the strategic level is not enough. So this means ad hoc insight creation, ad hoc research. And on the operational level is metrics and analytics, mainly. And throughout this journey of design, uh, we take care of the customer involvement. So, you know, it could be customer interviews, customer validation, user testing, and whatever. But all of this is carried out as one one uh, as a whole. And for that, we actually have a process. So if a designer is, needs, uh, is in need of insight, meaning that they ask these questions, what do I do not know? What is preventing me from, from uh, proceeding with the project? Very often, <laughs> it could be like this, that I'm unaware what I'm doing. I need some research. But that's not like a lack of insight. That's just like you don't know what problem you're solving. So you should always be able to, to uh, explicate it so that this is what I don't know and this is what, I, what is preventing me from uh, continuing. So the designer checks the fridge. That will be the research repository. If there's a meal that they find suitable for themselves, so then they're happy they can continue with their, their, their project. If not, 
if they need special diets, they will contact the customer inside team. Many times, customer inside team is able to cook some new special meal from available ingredients. If not, then uh, special ingredients are needed, and then the, the team will help to, to uh, choose the methods and, and uh, practicalities and help with if it's research, if it's customer involvement, and what, what not. But the process exists for two reasons. Without this process, designer would start inside building from scratch every time by themselves. And without having all sources of customer data in the same customer inside team, we would not have anything in the fridge or the fridge altogether. So this is why, why, why we're doing it. One last thing. Uh, now that I look back this four-year journey at OP, uh, the development of design and customer inside competence. Uh, this, is, this graph uh, describes how the design competence and the resource have been building up uh, throughout the years. Many of you probably know that it's something we've been concentrating on. Uh, before any designers, there was still market research. That has been carried out for years. In 2012, at OP, customer experience metrics, uh, we started uh, gathering those. The design competence and the resources were, were growing, uh, but the inside wasn't. So it was as late as 2017 when we actually were ramping up this uh, combination of different, uh, different uh, data resources. And as I look back, I would say this is very, very late in the process. So if you plan to grow your design resources, please also <laughs> grow your inside resources, because I like to say that design and inside competence should grow hand in hand. So don't do what we did, but what I tell you to. <laughs> And this is because I'd say design loves it. So, thank you, Pia. Excellent work. <laughs> I think there was a lot of insight. But does uh, the audience have any questions or something unanswered based on our Pia's excellent uh, walkthrough? There's one uh, hand. Maybe you can shout out, and I'll try to repeat the question. Did you say quantitative? Or co so how do I make sure that all the qualitative data we have is still valid? Well, it often, well, of course it changes. So, so, so I'm asking, uh, I'm, I'm asked, how can I make sure, like, how can designer make sure that the fridge that contains qualitative insights, they are still valid while you check the timestamp, for example, as you do with meals, you don't eat old meals. But, uh, of course, the, the customer insight team is there to help you. So if, it's, if you're unclear what to do with these meals, are these edible, so then contact the team. I think the whole thing is that we, we have the process because we are, we are dozens of designers and, and a handful of inside teams. So, so we have the process so that we can uh, get around our daily life. But of course, there's human interaction and, and explanations and figuring things out together. The thing is that you need the inside team to support the designers. Thank you. Any other questions? There's one. We'll have uh, time to take one more question, and that's it then. There. How do we scale design maturity without hiring more designers? Well, I think what we have done uh, creating this customer insight team is something that we do to add quality. Uh, to the da daily operations. So there's the head of the design here in the audience if he wants to comment on, but, but I think that if you just pile up designers without growing the inside competence side by side or hand, by, hand in hand, the designers will 
starve out because they need the meals. So I think that's, that, that will be my recipe at least. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia, for coming. Please give a big hand to Pia.